please join me in welcoming Professor John Hager. Okay, thanks, uh, thanks, Ben, for that uh, warm welcome. Um, okay, I have maybe two uh, points I want to make at the beginning. Uh, the first one is that this is a report on a, uh, as you probably hear from a lot of speakers, on a project that's underway rather than just you know something that's finally completed. And so I hope you bear that in mind as I as I go through. The second point is that. Uh, I think I tried to cover uh, probably too much ground today, I mean, and you probably think, well, we could spend a bit longer on this or, or on that. This is really an overview of this uh, of this of this project that I'm talking about, which really does have uh, this this title. Um, and so the focus is going to be very much on the whole question of um, of populism and, and what we uh, what we mean by it, and in a sense trying to deconstruct it in relation to the case of Italy, uh, even though I think you begin to see obvious analogies uh, with, uh, with other countries um, uh, in, in recent years. So uh, this is a, a quick overview of what, I, what I'd like to try and achieve in my hour or so uh, that, that I have uh, for this presentation. First of all, to talk a little bit about populism, um, a term that's come back uh, with, with uh, something of a uh, perhaps a too much wider uh, currency in, in, in recent years, particularly in relation to contemporary American presidential politics. Um, but I'm going to be trying to examine it across the country uh, in terms of Italy, not just in terms of national averages, to get a sense that uh, we're always talking about variation around some kind of national mean rather than, um, in a sense, reducing an entire country to, to, to a pinhead, uh, uh, so to speak. Uh, one of the things I'm going to uh, address uh, in detail is the idea of personalistic political leadership and parties and how, um, in a sense, you could, you could see Italy as, a, as, a, as an example of this, uh, an early example in a sense, and other countries now perhaps following in a similar direction. I'm also going to talk about the rise of, of internet-based politics um, in the context of the so-called um, Five Star Movement, or Movimento Cinque Stelle, which has uh, come into uh, 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 importance in Italy since 2009, when it was first founded, and as we'll see in 2013, actually did very well. It was uh, in terms of a single political entity, had the, had the highest percentage of votes in the 2013 national election. Um, but then finally, I'm going to draw attention to something that correlates very highly with the rise of these two facets, if you like, of contemporary populism. Uh, this is decreasing electoral participation, the declining turnout uh, in elections in Italy, uh, where turnouts historically down until the 1990s were, were very high, uh, often well over 80%. Um, and a lot of this is connected in, in the media and more generally uh, by scholars too, to criticism of the so-called political caste, the idea of uh, professional politicians who are essentially in cahoots with various uh, interests of one, uh, one sort or another and against, if you like, the interests of the, of the people. Um, and at least one uh, uh, thesis that this often generates is the notion that populism is attracting people who've been uh, non-voters. I think we'll see in this case that it's uh, actually more complex and that abstentionism, in a sense, absenting yourself from politics uh, has become increasingly a form of politics itself uh, beyond uh, the capacity of populist movements to attract uh, supporters. Anyway, more, more on that later. So I'm really going to look at, if you like, three Italian case studies. The first of these is Silvio Berlusconi, uh, tycoon, politician, and, um, and his role in creating um, uh, a synthesized kind of central uh, center right uh, in Italy, uh, uh, beginning in the uh, in the mid 1990s, really from 1994 uh, down until really 2013. Uh, secondly, uh, the internet-based uh, Movimento Cinque Stelle, or Five Star Movement, which has become particularly important um, since 2009, and current polls, as we'll see, uh, suggest. Um, are, are true, uh, could in fact, uh, 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 when there's a, uh, a general election in Italy, which will happen between now and 2018, most 
speculate will be next year, could in fact be, uh, uh, could emerge as in a sense in a position of, of, of um, being able, willing is another question, being able to form a national government. And then the third uh, uh, focus is on absten uh, abstentionism or decreased electoral participation as a symptom of dis disaffection from regular parties, but also discussing whether it's truly a deliberate strategy of abstention or whether it's just uh, uh, apathy, if you like, uh, and a population waiting, in a sense, for someone to come along and mobilize them. So let's have a brief discussion at the beginning here uh, of populism. This is, of course, part of the uh, presentation where uh, you might say, well, stop a minute and let's talk a lot more about this. Um, um, and maybe in the question and answer section we can talk more about this. Populism today, I mean, there's a, a huge literature, that, of course, that's uh, appeared on this topic uh, in, recent, in recent years. Um, generally, it's associated with the idea of going directly to the people as opposed to using conventional party channels uh, for articulating positions, aggregating, aggregating interests, you know, the classic kind of definition of what political parties do in political systems. Um, but it also reflects disillusionment with what we can call the regime of parties, so the idea that parties, in fact, uh, anymore attract people in terms of, of their uh, identification uh, with, with parties. But one of the things I'd say about Italy immediately is that there's a long history of this in Italy. Uh, this didn't just sort of just suddenly burst into the open in the 1990s. If you go back to the period after, uh, World War II, uh, one had the phenomenon of what was called in Italian qualunquismo after Second World War. This is really is the politics of the everyman. Qualunque means a kind of everyday uh, person, everyday kind of uh, attitudes. And, and so this phenomenon was called qualunquismo, and, and in various parts of Italy, particularly in parts of the South like Naples, after the Second World War, local politicians, in a sense, presented themselves as, as, in a sense, direct representatives of the people, unmediated by, by political parties. And so one of the issues here is, was there some kind of golden age in Italy before populism? Uh, that's hard to say. I mean, arguably, you could say that fascism itself began as a populist movement after World War I and, and became fascism uh, over the course of time. It began as an alternative to the existing uh, parties and was seen particularly by its proponents as going beyond them in transcending, for example, the left-right division, which was historically of such importance in, in Italian politics. So it usually involves then this claim of transcendence of the traditional left-right divide. Uh, but typically, at least in Europe today and in Italy, it's usually given a right-wing kind of connotation, nationalist, protectionist, and so on. Uh, of course, in the U.S., it has a quite different history. And if you go back to the 1890s, early 1900s, populism often has a kind of more left-wing um, uh, sentiment associated with it, even though, as we know, the, the populist party in, 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 in the United States in the 1890s and early uh, 1900s um, really f uh, founded on racial divisions, particularly divisions between its western and its southern uh, branches in terms of attitudes towards racial integration. Uh, ironically, most discussions of populism, given the emphasis on the people, um, often uh, focus too on, on the power flowing from a particular leader. Uh, other words have kind of grown up to try and uh, uh, account for this patrimonialism in the Italian case, that in a sense that you have to have a, a, a uh, a powerful, charismatic kind of figure who, in a sense, is the one who replaces the party as the channel, if you like, for interests, uh, for uh, articulating and aggregating interests. And also in the Italian case, very strongly, a sense of what's sometimes been called in the literature prebendialism, which is, of course, well, uh, beyond the sort of sense that the leader is going to, is going to represent the people, he's also going to reward the people, and he's going to reward some people more than other people, and these are going to be the people, of course, who are the strongest supporters of the uh, patrimonial leader. Um, and so there, there are these connections that are often made 
with populism in Italy that I think probably have been largely, well, perhaps patrimonialism, but not prebendialism uh, so much, uh, say, in the, in the contemporary American case. So there are strong connections then to uh, client, uh, clientelism, clientelism, patronage politics, and what in Spanish, of course, would be called cachiquismo. The strong charismatic leader as a cleanser and deliverer, uh, but also as someone who's going to deliver the goods to you as well. And one of the other things that uh, many writers about populism have noted, it tends to emerge very much in periods when other parties are failing to mobilize in the way that they've done, uh, mobilize voters in the way that they've done historically, um, and with rising uh, de uh, or increasing, uh, decreasing turnout or increasing abstentionism uh, in, in, in elections. So let's turn to these three, my three case studies of, of moments, if you like, of populism in the Italian uh, case over the last uh, uh, 30 years or so. Um, and so the first one is to draw attention to the idea of the, of the personal leader, the powerful uh, figure who is going to set everything, to uh, restore everything, set everything uh, to right. It's important to understand the context in which Berlusconi um, arose or came to power. This was the period of uh, what was called uh, uh, tangentopoli in, in Italian um, politics in the uh, early 1990s. This was a period of the exposure of a vast corruption scandal involving both the Socialist and the Christian Democratic parties, which was exposed in Milan uh, in 1990-1991. Both the Christian Democrats and the Socialists really collapsed as a result of this scandal. The Communist Party, which was the other um, major political party in Italy at that time, collapsed for different reasons. It, it sort of collapsed as a result of the end of the Cold War. And in many ways, as people have pointed out, from 1945 until 1992, the Cold War, in a sense, ran through the middle of Italy. I mean, you had, even though the Communist Party in Italy had largely ceased to have any kind of pro-Soviet uh, positions, at least formally, uh, long before uh, that, I'm not trying to suggest that that was the case, nevertheless, these political affiliations went back to the origins of the Cold War in the late 1940s. So what we had was a party system collapsing, and it's in this context that Berlusconi came into his own. Um, and as we, as I uh, show on this uh, PowerPoint here, he was prime minister really three times, uh, uh, briefly, 1994, 1995, then for a very long term, the longest term until uh, recently of any prime minister in post-World uh, War II. Italian political history, you may say, well, that's not saying very much, and that would be true, but, you know, before it was just guys shuffling around a table, I mean, many of the same people always showed up, uh, just with different people in different uh, uh, cabinet offices. Um, and then 2008 to 2011, when he was fine, where he was forced out, largely under German pressure, rather than from uh, within Italy itself, although the role of the president of Italy, uh, Giorgio Napolitano, you know, is important there as well. But partly because Berlusconi had failed really to uh, play part of the bargain that at least the Germans thought that they uh, had with the Italians over managing uh, the Eurozone crisis. Well, where did Berlusconi come from? Well, he was the owner of um, Fininvest, which has more recently become Mediaset, which is the largest television uh, company in, in Italy, owning all of the major private channels by the early 1990s. But he'd received this as a blessing from his friend uh, Bettino Craxi, the former socialist prime minister. I always put socialist in, in brackets when he referred to Craxi. Um, um, uh, when Craxi was prime minister in the early 1980s. Until that time, there had been really just local television networks in Italy. It was Berlusconi who nationalized them and who broadcast, you know, uh, essentially uh, soap operas, reality TV shows. That sounds familiar. Um, he was also, by this time, the, the president of uh, AC Milan, the, one of the two major uh, football clubs, soccer clubs in, in, in the city of Milan. 
Um, in 2012 here, he was uh, uh, rated the sixth wealthiest person in Italy, so he has deep pockets. So like a lot of other sort of populist pat patrimonial leaders, he doesn't have to get other rich people uh, to, uh, to pay for his uh, election campaigns. He can pay for them himself. And he was uh, rated, and I was disappointed to discover that he was only rated 169th in the world. This is in Forbes magazine, who for some reason have now become the gold standard in terms of deciding who the wealthiest people in the world are, rather like US News and World Report is for you know, deciding which colleges and universities are the best. Uh, he entered politics uh, beginning in really 1993, uh, really at the outset of this crisis of the other parties, and he invented a political party from scratch, which he was able to do um, because of the relative openness of the Italian electoral system, even under the new system that came into, that came into being in, in 1993. And he put together a coalition of parties with his party, Forza Italia, in the middle of this, uh, the Northern League, which is a regionalist party, which should uh, come into existence really in the 1980s uh, as, a, as a force, uh, but which represented a, a different part of Northern Italy from where Forza Italia was, uh, was to prove uh, successful. And then amazingly, uh, added to this, um, uh, Alianza Nazionale, which was the, uh, what was left, or became Alianza Nazionale at this time, of the old Movimento Sociale Italiano, which was the neo-fascist political party, which was very strong in southern Italy. So Berlusconi put together this very weird coalition, the Northern League and the Alianza Nazionale, the leaders of these two parties, uh, Fini, in the case of uh, Alianza Nazionale, and, and Bossi, the leader of the, of the Northern League, couldn't stand one another. They couldn't bear to be in the same room with one another. But Berlusconi was the mediator between these two, persuading them that they had an interest in putting in their lot with him in order to create a, a nationwide uh, alliance. I think the most important thing to know about Berlusconi is in many ways that he was a very good salesman and polemicist. He started out really as a real estate salesman, if this sounds familiar. It is. Um, uh, in fact, a huge chunk of, uh, of the eastern suburbs of Milan, near Linati Airport, uh, called by Berlusconi Milano Due, was constructed by him. This was his first entrepreneurial exercise. And this was, this was the, the base upon which he then built his media empire. So his media empire comes out of uh, real estate, uh, residential real estate. Um, in his case, and, and was very good at messaging. He's a very good mess, you know, at, make, at, at selling himself as a kind of uh, self-made man, man of the people. So this is a you know, characteristic picture of Berlusconi from 1994 in this case. One of the things that uh, he was facing was trying, I'm sorry about the quality of some of, of these figures. I blame Sebastian, no, I can't blame Sebastian for this one. Uh, who helped years ago <laughs> on a similar kind of project. Uh, one of the things that you're having to deal with in Italy is that it's always been a, a, an, an amazingly fragmented polity. Uh, this map shows the leading party averaged over this period from 1952 until 1992. So all election, national elections for the Chamber of Deputies over this long period of time. And you can see here, like the Communist Party uh, incredibly entrenched in central Italy, you know, places like Bologna, uh, Florence, Siena, uh, Pisa, places like that, with a few uh, white islands, so to speak, of, of support for the Christian Democrats. The Christian Democrats incredibly entrenched in the Northeast and then various parts of Southern Italy. But then all these other parties, often getting uh, at least five to eight percent of the vote, uh, neither of the two largest parties by uh, the early 60s, the Christian Democrats and the Communist Party here, uh, neither of them ever had more than about 30, or rarely, that's a better way of putting it, more than 35 to 36 percent of the votes. Um, and so they always had to go into coalition uh, after the late 1950s with some of these other parties, the socialists, the liberals, the social democrats, 
Uh, this is the uh, movement of Charlie. Here you can see how, how southern it is. The monarchists, um, <laughs> the Republican Party. So lots of small parties. And so for many years, you've had coalitions across these parties, often formed after the election. One of the things that the legislation in 1993 was done, which created a new electoral system for Italy, was to try and get coalitions being formed before elections, so people knew who they were voting for, in addition to their party, uh, what the composition of the government was going to be like afterwards. And Berlusconi spotted this right away, and that was why I think, uh, well, that's part of our argument, uh, uh, Mike Shen and I, the argument for why Berlusconi was so successful was his ability to put together this strange uh, uh, geographical coalition of northern interests, southern interests, and, and those scattered around the country supporting uh, his, his party. And remember, there's nothing new to this. I mean, Italy, is, uh, Italy had a whole series of separate, was a whole s separate series of, of polities down until uh, really 1871 when it was finally uh, geographically, uh, or territorial, I should say, unified uh, under the Kingdom of Italy in, uh, in 1871, but historically was, a, was, uh, was, was very uh, dismembered or fragmented, and this, of course, is one of the great themes of Machiavelli's The Prince, the division uh, of Italy into all these different um, polities, and in particular the polity controlled by the papacy. And so this, is, this was the, the burden, in a sense, of modern Italy is how, has been to how to suture together uh, these, these parts, that people's attachments, people's uh, uh, historical um, sense of themselves and so on has been connected in many ways to these, to these distinctive uh, political pasts. And this is, of course, a big theme in Italian uh, political science, Italian political sociology. Well, what are, the, what are the arguments that are often made about the role of Berlusconi then in this, in this context? Uh, well, one of the things, of course, and probably one of the main reasons why he ended up not being very successful as a prime minister was that he put an enormous amount of energy into his own personal affairs, which, of course, is not what initially at least seemed to be attracting people to support him, sort of what are called in Italian laws ad personam. These are laws just for him. I mean, things that would apply only to the kind of person who had the sorts of interests that he had, like conflict of interest in relation to uh, media control, uh, and yet at the same time occupying the, the uh, uh, premiership of, uh, of, of, of Italy. Uh, one of the other charges that was made to him, which of course was one of his big appeals, was his appeal to uh, the self-interest, particularly of self-employed and lower middle class people across Italy. Italy and Greece have uh, the largest numbers of people who are self-employed of any countries in the European Union. And of course this means, of course, they only have to pay their taxes usually once a year. You know, they're not, their taxes are not being deducted at source, you know, like uh, people who are on salary or, or work for a business, a big business, or work for a uh, work for the government, and so on. And one of the things that uh, Berlusconi tended to do in his television appearances and so on was to really not just condone, but to encourage a culture of what in Italian is called abusivismo and condono. Abusivismo is, is kind of violating the law, actually, but in your own interests, like building an archaeological zone or, you know, adding a story to your house, you know, without getting any kind of planning permission. Condono is this idea that, you know, you forgive things after the fact. I mean, it's a, been a very powerful appeal over the years in Italian politics. It's not unique to Berlusconi, but it was something that he turned into an art form. Essentially, uh, yeah, you've done all of this stuff, it was illegal, but we'll now forgive you. You know, so it's like getting some sort of, of, of papal blessing for uh, or forgiveness for your sins, I mean, in a way. I mean, you could interpret it that way. And of course, quite massive tax evasion. You know, uh, with dentists, for example, you know, uh, reporting incomes, uh, you know, a tenth of those uh, of laborers who were working for, uh, for various businesses. Um, he also butted up the Catholic Church on all kinds of ethical issues, but then, of course, ran a very public private life. 
you know, with all the charges against him uh, that we're all familiar with, the Bunga Bunga parties at his uh, mansion outside of Milan and so on. Uh, his scandalous opinions, but these were things that attracted people to him. You know, talking about Barack Obama's tan, if anyone remembers uh, that. Uh, making very favorable comments about Mussolini uh, and playing down, for example, the role of the fascist regime in, in World War II and in the Holocaust. Uh, perhaps most importantly, from the kind of populist point of view, posing as a savior, as somebody who could kind of really put Italy back together again and a sort of political genius, but often without any discussion of specific policies whatsoever. Uh, for example, one of his most famous phrases, I am the Jesus Christ of politics. And then finally, of course, that so much of his attention was taken up with campaigning um, and also with uh, uh, trying to get Parliament to pass uh, laws on his behalf that he really neglected, in a derelict way, the management of the Italian economy. Now, of course, Berlusconi is still around, even as the center-right that he put together has really disintegrated since 2011, but he still presents himself in this way. Um, and so now at age 79, it will be 80, I think, uh, September 29th uh, this year, and as of 18th of March this year in Palermo, he said, I'm returning to the field. He said, I'm studying the internet. <laughs> so he's moving on beyond television, and and public rallies, which were his major way of, of communicating. Um, uh, and we'll see why in a minute, why he's studying the, the internet. I think it's true, though, that he actually did successfully create a kind of populist right in Italy, at least um, for electoral purposes, let's put it that way. I don't think it achieved anything in terms of, of what many of its voters would have, would have hoped. And he was definitely the personal glue to this. Um, and we'll see that this was a really very important part of his, of his appeal, was this uh, ability to kind of put together a coalition. This, this shows the major party in 1994 for the Chamber of Deputies by Providence. My point again, just to kind of reiterating it, is that in Italy you have to win by putting together some kind of geographic coalition. You can't just win um, in, a, in a sense by just collecting votes equivalently across all parts of Italy, because that won't happen because of the distinctive um, uh, histories of these different uh, parts of the country. What, we sh what it shows here is that the light blue are the parts uh, of Italy that f where Forza Italia was the, uh, which is Berlusconi's party, was the dominant uh, party. The green ones are where the Northern League was the dominant party. This is just for the elect, uh, this election in, in 1994. The red ones of, an, of the new kind of resurrected uh, communist uh, party, but really much more now a center-left uh, party, um, which was the uh, Party of Democratic Socialists. And then the dark blue areas are the, are the areas where Alianza Nazionale, which was the, uh, the, the, the new party uh, coming out of the old neo-fascist neo party, where it was the major party. And then the other colors, uh, the yellow and the purple, where there was no single uh, dominant party. So you can see here a real interesting uh, political pattern. And if Berlusconi had not put together a coalition, he wouldn't have won. The, the red areas essentially would have won, um, in terms of numerically, as well as in terms of its geographical spread. And the light blue areas, even though he was strong in and around Milan, uh, wouldn't have been enough to compensate for that. But you can see this kind of pattern, mainly in northern Italy in his case, and then in Sicily and, and in the toe of Calabria and in, and in southern Sardinia. The, these were the places where Berlusconi uh, appealed uh, the most directly rather than through his, uh, through his alliance. This shows the results for the two major electoral alliances from 1994 to 2006 over the, over the four uh, major elections over that period of time. Um, and uh, uh, again, this is for the Chamber of Deputies. The dark areas here are the left of center uh, alliance and the hatched areas, the, sh the shaded areas, are of the, are of the, um, are of the, of the center right. 
Um, and, and I think this kind of shows, again, a, a, something of a persistence of the same pattern. And then these particular areas in the northern parts of southern Italy, which turn out to be the, the, the important uh, uh, shifting uh, centers, these are the places where the elections are, are, are won and lost. And that was true across this entire period under the electoral system that prevailed from 1993 down to 2006. Here we have him again. I mean, similar kind of gestures. He seemed to be de rigueur. Uh, here we have his sort of the public um, image of, of, uh, of Berlusconi. Everyone can, can, see, can see that. Greeting. Uh, President and Mrs. Obama. Uh, obviously, Silvio isn't too interested in, in Barack uh, in, in this case. He's much more interested in, in Mrs. Which, of course, is part of Berlusconi's appeal. Uh, as of 2008, uh, this was really the last uh, hurrah of Berlusconi. You can see here the three major parties by this time uh, Berlusconi has merged with Alianza Nazionale, um, and so there's still the Northern League, that's the one over on the right. There's the new uh, Party of Liberty, which is the combination of Forza Italia and Alianza Nazionale, which is in, in the middle in blue there. And then we have the uh, uh, Partito Democratico, the, the Democratic Party, which is the main center-left party as of 2008. And you can see here something about both the persisting pattern, uh, geographical pattern in Italy, which is really quite strong, but the ability of Berlusconi, again, because he emerges uh, um, out of this election as the dominant figure by putting together a coalition again with the Northern League. Um, um, and, and this partly is that he didn't compete so much up here with the Northern League, so that was a strategic decision. So together they kind of partition Italy along a kind of populist or neo-populist sort of line, both of them appealing to uh, a population in terms of uh, you know, restricting immigration, trying to uh, regulate um, uh, uh, the economy to be uh, more directly uh, uh, serving the interests of, of, uh, of Italian businesses and so on rather than, uh, and also cutting back, uh, one must say, on, on state uh, welfare policies and so on and so forth, um, particularly uh, compared to uh, the Democratic Party. Um, one of the things that we uh, were interested in doing was looking at the degree to which these parties uh, were truly clustering. I mean, rather than just looking at it in terms of, of uh, percent of the vote or deciles or whatever, but methodologically looking at the degree to which there was a true kind of spatial uh, clustering across the uh, parties in terms of areas of high or low support. And you can see here that uh, there is very much this kind of pattern. Uh, places where the, the uh, this is the Democratic Party on the left, the combination of Forza Italia and Alianza Nazionale, uh, Party of Liberty in the middle, and then the Northern League over there. And you can see obviously how clustered the Northern League is. It's a, obviously a Northern party, not looking very much at least at that time anyway, for votes anywhere further south. Uh, and then the others also uh, pretty clustered in terms of high, high, and then low, low. Um, interestingly here, of course, the low lows, this is, means that the provinces with lows are all um, next to ones that are also very low. Precisely the areas where often Forza Italia didn't run, or Party of Liberty didn't run candidates against the Northern League in order to, in a sense, enhance the possibilities of coalition building. And then, and here very much, the clustering of the Democratic Party and the former red zone, traditionally socialist, communist strongholds in northern well, Italy. Now, we could go into some detail, which I can do at the end, if you like, on how to go about doing this kind of measures of, of spatial order correlation and so on, um, which we use for this, and we'll see later uh, when we also look at abstentionism. But it's just a way of trying to take into account the fact that, of course, uh, spatial data are always uh, intercorrelated. There's never an independence of our observations. The observations are always dependent on one another. And the further away you get from a particular place, 
uh, the dependence uh, decreases. But um, it's, it's in a sense to take seriously the fact that our data is spatially autocorrelated, uh, that we do things like that. And you do end up sometimes seeing very interesting anomalies, different kinds of patterns, geographical patterns that you wouldn't otherwise see. Okay, the second moment in talking about Italian populism it's about the rise of a very different kind of movement, also with a very strong personalistic uh, leadership, but not based around television, uh, or on control over television, or about putting together coalitions of existing political movements, but creating a new movement using the internet. Um, and the Five Star Movement um, is, this, is this movement, and it's led really by a comedian, you know, why not? Uh, these days, uh, called Beppe Grillo, is from Genoa, quite well known uh, across Italy as a whole, and a, a web entrepreneur, a guy called Gian Roberto Casaleggio, who uh, died earlier this week, so it's going to be interesting to see whether his loss uh, you know, is, is of great importance in the future of this particular movement. It was really founded in 2009 by these two people. And so in that sense, it, it emerged really very quickly. Um, really, as a consequence, people argue, and Grillo himself says this, uh, of the, the economic crisis of the time, so the, the financial, economic financial crisis of 2008-09. Um, but in many ways, it has some older roots as well. Uh, Casalejo, for example, was talking about the, the internet as a pure form of democracy and so on. Uh, at least in, in the early 2000s. Um, but in many ways its growth has been even more spectacular um, because this hasn't involved any kind of pre-existing coalition. It's a completely separate enterprise, very different from the Berlusconi type populism. This is about creating an entirely new movement based on mobilizing supporters using the internet. And so some of its major themes are things like the, the popular anger with the ruling caste, I mean, the caste of politicians, the economic crisis of 2008-09, the austerity policies, particularly of the Monti technocratic government that Italy had after Berlusconi was ousted in 2011, 2011 to 2013, and the, the you know, traditional you know, complaint of many Italians, of course, of, of government corruption. The corruption hasn't gotten any better since the collapse of the Christian Democrats and Socialists. It's persisted or even perhaps even got worse. Um, one of the things to note is that this is a quite remarkable in the context of Italy how well this movement did. Suddenly, never having put up candidates, the candidates were entirely recruited through the internet. Um, I mean, and, and there wasn't much in the way of any kind of quality control, so that turned out to be a real bit of a problem for uh, M5S, uh, Movimento Cinque Stelle. And, and you can see here how well they did. They actually got the highest percentage of, of votes of any uh, political entity in the election of 2013. But because of the coalitional emphasis, the PD, together with its co-parties uh, over here, was able, in a sense, then to outnumber uh, the, in terms of forming the government, and because of the peculiar nature of the electoral system that was introduced in 2005-06, the party, the party coalition that has the largest number of votes gets a top-up in terms of the number of seats in the Chamber of Deputies, uh, uh, tallied nationwide in the Chamber of Deputies, and by region in the Italian Senate. So this was the entity that formed the government and, and not uh, uh, the Five Star Movement, even though it had the largest number of votes. And so this is what you end up with seats in that kind of peculiar electoral system. So even though they got the most votes, they ended up with, uh, with only 108 seats. Um, and, and of course, there are lots of complaints about this electoral system. And currently, Italy is in the process of designing yet another electoral system, whether, you know, and, and there's legislation now um, before the Italian parliament to, to change it yet again, but with, still with some kind of topping up to try and create some sort of stable majority. One of the amazing things about, about um, 
this phenomenon in Italy is how low the penetration of social media uh, are in Italy overall. In terms of numbers of people, uh, if you're thinking about the electoral body in Italy, maybe 50 million people, only about 31 million have some kind of connection to the internet. Only 10 million have a, a Facebook account and only three and a half million have some kind of Twitter account. I have some other numbers somewhere in here uh, which haven't shown up on this, uh, comparing it to other countries. This is much, much lower uh, than many other European countries like Germany, for example, and certainly much, much lower uh, than, than even in the United States. So, so this is an interesting phenomenon. Um, well, who are the people who support the Movimento Cinque Stelle, the Five Star Movement? Well, Demos, which is a, a polling organization, did a, a very detailed study in 2012. So this is early on in the history of the movement before the 2013 election. And you can see here a real male bias, 63% males, uh, six, but 64% over the age of 30, they tended to be left-leaning, urban, better educated, um, but really high rates of unemployment, you can see. So educated people who are unemployed, you know, really, uh, maybe something that tells us about a, a different type of populism here. This is not the same as Berlusconi's populism. These are not the people who are looking for condono or tax evasion. These are people looking for a job. Um, only 50% employed full time, 18% students compared to only 3% of the national population. 66% feel that Italian economy is in decline compared to 43% uh, nationally. Only 4% satisfied with Italian democracy. 83% very dissatisfied with Italian democracy compared to only 19% nationally. A lot of distrust towards all institutions, parties, big business but keen on the people, the concept of the people, and new technologies as opposed to old media. So these are not the people who are watching TV all the time. These are the people who are on their iPhones and iPads and, and, and so on and so forth, or at least this, in terms of the, this, this group who've been polled. Uh, but since, I think, 2012, this has changed a bit, and the movement's become more Eurosceptic, and it's clear that Grillo has become more authoritarian in his behavior towards his uh, political representatives. He cannot serve in Parliament because of a, a conviction uh, for manslaughter. He was in a car accident uh, years ago. So that we would call that, I suppose, vehicular manslaughter. Um, and interesting, the support is also, particularly in the 2013 election, as we'll see in a minute, has become more southern rather than northern. And I think this is interesting because th this is the part of Italy that has the lowest internet penetration. So people in the south are not voting because they're, you know, they think of the internet and, and direct democracy or things like that. They're supporting it, this movement because it's an alternative to the caste and to the usual uh, characters. Uh, one classification has really four types of voters, which means that this is a complete catch-all, isn't it? Leftist consistent, rightist consistent. What kind of categorization is this? Inconsistent post-ideological. I love any love these. And inconsistent confused. I mean, that means just about everyone under the sun can support the 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 the, the um, uh, five star movement. But what's clear is that they're becoming competitive in local as well as national elections. And, are, and there are indications that they're, norm, we can say, normalizing, in fact, as a party. For example, their candidate for the mayor of Rome, this is uh, Virginia Raggi, and has actually shown herself to be absolutely, the, at least by my lights, the best debater amongst all of the candidates uh, for mayor of Rome. Um, and, uh, and was selected deliberately on the basis of her, of her uh, both intellectual and uh, televisual qualities, let's put it that way, uh, rather, than, uh, rather than just uh, randomly. Uh, one of the things that really interests me, of course, is whether this internet thing is really all it, it shows up to be. 
in a recent study, uh, Vetsoni and Mancosu uh, show that, in fact, a lot of it isn't really just about people who are isolated um, on their machines, on their computers, and so on. But they're, in fact, that there's a lot of, of, of uh, uh, sociality associated to, with the five-star movement phenomenon. Exposure to friends and acquaintances has increased propensity to support it quite dramatically. So it's not just an online phenomenon. Um, and so the, there are uneven, as we'll see when we look at the 2013 election results, it's very uneven geographically. And some places are more supportive than others, including many places with quite low internet penetration. So it's an extremely heterogeneous electorate with respect to census characteristics and with respect, respect to opinions. You remember that attempt at trying to classify them, and which ended up going nowhere. Local issues, disaffected electorates that are not the same everywhere, discussion networks, and ideology really not that important in the South as opposed to being against, having a kind of hostile uh, take on contemporary political parties. So in fact, it did much less well in places less connected though. So there's, the internet obviously has some role as well. What's clear is that it's not a far right populism at all, but more a response to the crisis and the ability of the internet to mobilize beyond the confines of traditional parties. And I think this is what um, makes it a really interesting phenomenon and quite different uh, from the Berlusconi phenomenon. This isn't just a sort of Berlusconi redux, you know, with now with a Pepe Grillo as, the same, as, as essentially fulfilling Berlusconi's role. It's a very different role. It's a very different kind of political movement. And it's a populism that really transcends a lot of the typical categories. So the yellow areas on here are the, are the provinces where, a majority, where the majority of the vote was for the Five Star Movement in the uh, February 2013 election. Uh, the light blue are the, are the areas where uh, the, um, the uh, 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 Forza Italia, the, 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 the center-right coalition involving uh, Berlusconi, uh, got was the largest uh, party, and then the red areas are where the uh, Democratic Party uh, had a majority of the vote. If we look at it in terms of winning groups in 2013, remember that was the problem for uh, the Five Star Movement. They were just alone, they weren't part of a larger coalition. This is for the Chamber of Deputies on the left, and that's for the Senate on the right. Um, in the Senate, everything ended up really being kind of uh, 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 almost no majority. There was no majority, actually, in the Senate initially following the election for any coalition, but a really quite large coalition uh, majority for the Democratic Party at the expense of, uh, of Grillo and the uh, Movimento Cinque Stelle. As you can see here, they ended up with, with relatively uh, little in the way of being a winning grouping uh, when it came to the election of 2013. And that, in many ways, is their Achilles heel. Uh, they rely very heavily on being able to, um, to mobilize their own particular electorate, but whether that's enough, this is for the Chamber and for the Senate in 2000, and, um, and, uh, and 13, whether that's enough without putting together some other kinds of allies, maybe they have something to learn uh, from Berlusconi uh, in that respect. You can see here in the run-up to the 2013 election, the red line at the top is for the Democratic Party, uh, the blue line is for uh, Berlusconi, uh, the, the yellow line is for, is for Grillo. You can see how, how the polls got it, got it wrong. I mean, they completely underestimated uh, the support for the uh, Five Star Movement in terms of uh, a lot of the problems that pollsters face uh, worldwide these days. One is that they often don't, for example, poll people who just have mobile phones. Okay, they poll just people with landlines. They, uh, they select uh, their, uh, their uh, samples in such a way that in fact they often marginalize many of the very people who end up supporting groups like uh, the, the, the Five Star Movement. And it hasn't lost its, um, 
its, uh, its, its influence or its power. This is, a, this is meta polling. This uh, compares all of the polls that have been done since the 2013 election. That's the Democratic Party at the top. The yellow line, uh, the red one, the yellow line is the uh, five star uh, movement. Um, and, and I think what's, uh, the green line is the Northern League and the blue line is Berlusconi, as you can see. Berlusconi seems to be in something of a, of a, of a decline. Um, but the yellow line is the interesting one here because it really has bounced back, you can see, uh, even though it was a bump after the election uh, for the uh, uh, Democratic Party. It's bounced back and now uh, some of the most recent polls report it is really being likely if it was an election today, you know, the way the question's posed, uh, that it would, in fact, um, uh, be the main, main, the largest party. Um, and, and this, of course, remember, is typically uh, on, uh, on a sample that's under-reporting precisely the people who might actually vote for that movement. So this is the other facet of populism in, in contemporary Italy that I think is most fascinating, the rise of a really important internet-based populist movement, but a populism that doesn't bear much comparison at all to the kind of populism that was associated with Berlusconi. One of the arguments that goes along with both of these kinds of populism is that they're tapping into people who haven't previously been involved in politics, that they're mobilizing people who were non-voters or who were potential non-voters, in the sense of people now coming into the electorate, younger people, as the older people die off, and younger ones come in, uh, that in a sense they're now mobilizing people on populist grounds. And so partly this is like the recruiting ground uh, uh, thesis. Uh, the other one is though, of course, that absten abstentionism and deliberate not voting is in fact an alternative to, to this. Um, and that was the thing that interested us. To what extent can we try and investigate this? So first we've had Berlusconi's quite clearly right-wing populism, and now the movement, uh, the five-star movement phenomenon, uh, which is trending right, but I think is, is still much more of a catch-all. And there's still declining voter participation. So, so the, the numbers of people between 2008 and 2013, for example, still went down in terms of, but it's who, who is not voting is really the interesting question. Is it abstention, is it apathy? Is it barriers to voting? I mean, obviously in different places, uh, it could be all or, or, or one of these. Um, are there general trends or are there really local uh, factors that, that explain this? One of the things about Italy is that historically it's, been, it's had very high rates of, of turnout in elections, historic, without, being, without voting being compulsory like it is in Australia or some other uh, places. 80% uh, or more uh, down until the 19th. Uh, 80s, 1990s, but recent really quite dramatic declines. Uh, one of the other issues that arises for us is that Italy's population is aging at a really quite rapid rate. If it weren't for immigration, uh, Italy would be faced with a population structure not very different from Japan you know, within, within the next uh, uh, 10 to 15 years. So is turnout then age-related? Is it mainly, you know, that... Um, the population is aging, so a larger percentage of the population are, are, are elderly. Or is it more that different cohorts acquire or acquire different sorts of voting habits, depending on sort of mobilizing uh, actions at different periods? And is, does, is the economic crisis of 2008, 2013 then related to declining uh, turnout? Does it, in a sense, put people off voting rather than actually mobilizing them? So these are some of the hypotheses that we're interested in. Um, this gives you figures for the whole of Italy as the dark uh, line, black line in the middle there, going back to 1946 through 2013. And you can see here, through, the, uh, through until about 1983, uh, really quite very, very high rates of, of voting. I mean, compared to many other countries, certainly compared to the United States here. So very, actually very few barriers to voting in, in, in Italy. Um, and then for some different uh, provinces, the red one is Milan, the green one is Rome, and the, and the purple one is Palermo there. And, and what it shows is that since the uh, collapse of the old party system, really 19, 
1987, 1992, we've had this really quite monotonic, almost like monotonic decline with a bit of a, a resurrection there uh, between 2006 and 2008, particularly nationwide and, and, in, and in Rome. But, but generally, the, the, the trend here is, is, is downward. And we know that voter behavior is not the same everywhere. And we'll see in a minute, uh, population structures differ, very different in different parts of Italy in terms of the distribution of people in different age groups. Um, and so, you know, one hypothesis is that um, elderly people, I mean, typically in the United States, the assumption is always that the, the people post 65 vote more and, and vote more often, you know, that old joke, uh, than, do, than do people in younger age groups. Um, that isn't uh, uh, necessarily the case in Italy or everywhere. People in, older people in northern Italy, that survey show, tend to vote uh, at a slightly higher rate than the regular population. But in southern Italy, the elderly tend to vote at much lower rates than do everyone else. So the population pyramid matters enormously as you go from one part of Italy to another. This one up here in the top left is the population pyramid for Italy. It's a whole showing age group um, on the y-axis, and then uh, male and female, um, male purple, uh, female green on the, um, uh, on the uh, x-axis. That's Italy as a whole. The top right is Milan, the province of Milan, representative here supposedly of Lombardy. The bottom uh, uh, left one is, is Lazio, is Rome, within the region of Lazio. And then uh, the bottom right is the population pyramid uh, for, uh, for Palermo, uh, representing in this case Sicily. So you can see really quite different population structures across different parts of Italy. So the number of elderly are available, the number of younger people are available, and so on differs quite actually systematically from one part of Italy to another. So what we were interested in was kind of mapping this, the turnout, um, and the turnout change. So the turnouts, so on the left here is the actual just a, a measure of rates of turnout across provinces. The highest rates darker, um, purple, uh, lowest rates white in the top left. Um, the turnout clusters showing where there were areas of quite high turnout and then uh, areas where you had clusters of provinces with very low turnout. And then looking at the change between 2008 and 2013, um, and you can see there uh, real, really quite significant decreases in some parts of the north, but particularly in southern Italy, in Calabria and, and in Sicily. And not surprisingly then, that's reflected in when we look at the autocorrelation uh, between these different, these different provinces in terms of clusters. But what we were trying to get at was the degree to which there was maybe some cohort or uh, really more of a generational effect. When did people start voting, taking into account the distribution of people in different age groups across the provinces of Italy? Uh, not that many people left, of course, from pre-1927 in terms of year of birth. That's down the, the left-hand side. But we tried to identify really eight different cohorts here. Uh, to look at if there was any systematic difference, in a sense, in their propensity to turn out or, or not, as the case may be. And in terms of turnout change between 2008 and 2013, the degree to which you were now turning out in, in greater numbers in 2013 or lesser numbers in 2013 than in 2008. And, and, um, and again, we had some hypotheses about the disillusionment, perhaps, of people from the uh, 19, uh, uh, who really become eligible to vote in the 70s and 80s, um, aged between 47 and, and 56 as of 2012. Um, as you can see down the side, the expected relationship to turnout, negative with the oldest people, uh, positive, uh, uh, perhaps, with um, uh, many of the others, and then negative again with the people who were only just entering into the, uh, into the electorate. Um, and then we did a, a series of, um, of uh, regressions. The first one was just what we call a baseline ordinary least squares, which is down the left-hand side here. 
uh, with a bunch of uh, variables, control variables, along with the cohort uh, effect to see to what extent one could, could pick that up at the, at the national level. So this was across all provinces for 2013 um, using this baseline ordinary mean square. And then we introduced a spatial autocorrelation term, which is called a spatial lag, into a series of other regression models, uh, looking at turnout nationally, turnout change nationally, and then dividing the country up into two parts, the north and the south, and looking at turnout in 2013, and then turnout change from 2008 to 2013 across those, and then looking to see which variables came out as being uh, uh, some reasonable significance. Uh, and what's interesting here, let's go through some of the, uh, just a bit about the method and then talk about, talk about the results. So the idea is to have a baseline model, and in that we find we have these three variables that are most significant. Provincial unemployment rate, you know, has a negative effect, suppresses turnout. A pre-World War II co cohort effect, which also suppresses turnout, and then what we call a Berlusconi-1 cohort effect, which also suppresses turnout. So these are the three variables that seem to be having the biggest effect in the nationwide ordinary least squares model in terms of, without taking into account that all the provinces are, are correlated with one another to different, different degrees. Um, so, so that would be the story if we just did an ordinary least squares. But, you know, there are always problems of multicollinearity between these variables. We have a, an incredibly non-normal error term. And the conceptual existence of spatial autocorrelation suggests using spatial lag models. So uh, this is introducing some version of a spatial autocorrelation measure. And this term was really significant across different provincial groupings for both the nationally north and south for turnout in 2013 and turnout change. So uh, what we would argue on the basis of those results that we're looking at is that clustering is really a, a significant, particularly in northern Italy. So the Berlus Berlusconi one cohort, these were people who first became voters at the time that Berlusconi was entering into national politics. The, uh, what we would call the Silvio loyalist effect, if you like. These people were a particularly important predictor of increased turnout in national and northern models. They actually stuck with Berlusconi. That's the interesting thing. So here's a positive relationship here. So people who voted for him when they were first being mobilized into politics continued to, to do so. But the 1968 cohort and unemployment rates are also important in suppressing turnout nationally and in the South. So people who came of political age in the 1960s and 1970s uh, essentially were giving up on voting. And this, not just in uh, 2013, but in terms of diminished capacity to vote between 2008 and 2013. And this was particularly strong in southern Italy. So these are the where we've got most disillusioned people in a sense. We have these negative, uh, negative, co uh, negative coefficients. The, See, here's the 1968 negative, coalition in, uh, negative coefficient in the north. Um, and here are the more youthful voters who are also, uh, they're, they're not being very strongly mobilized either. So what does all this suggest? Well, all of this suggests, in fact, that rather than populism necessarily creating a new, you know, through mobilizing non-voters, Many non-voters continue to be non-voters. I mean, in that case, we saw there's a Berlusconi loyalist faction who continue to be of some significance, even in the face of the rise of the Five Star movement, for example, between 2008 and 2013. It's almost like something of an experiment there. Did those voters drift away to the, the Five Star movement? No, they, they stuck with Berlusconi, even though he was in pretty much term, what turned out to be terminal decline in 2013. And so I think it's very important then, what we have here is evidence against the idea that people who haven't been voting or have decided now not to vote are in a sense a, a ready recruiting ground for populist politics. Many of these people have in, in a sense decided that abstentionism is their, is, is their strategy. At least that's part of, of the uh, picture that we've painted here. 
So here we have the Berlusconi effect. Well, patrimonialism, at least in the typical way in which we thought of it into interacting with populism, seems to be de in decline in, in Italy. I mean, except for those Silvio loyalists that, that I talked about. But we have a new guy on the block, Beppe Grillo, and, and, and in many ways the, the, the Five Star Movement has become very much associated with him. The media, especially in Italy, refer to them collectively as the Grillini, you know, like the people who are just like supporters of his. I'm not sure that that's entirely um, right, but nevertheless, that's the way in which uh, it, the movement gets presented. Um, and so it, it is a populist party, but I think as we've seen, it's very, it's not a right-wing populist party. It's something of a melange, a kind of mixture of all kinds of elements. And then finally, declining turnout doesn't seem to be uh, necessarily a happy hunting ground for these populist parties. Certainly, um, Grillo has mobilized people, but what he, what, who he's mobilized, in fact, are people who were formerly supporters of many other political parties. And increasingly, we can see then abstentionism as, a, as an alternative to, in fact, even supporting um, populist parties, and here's my list of where, where did all this stuff come from. Thank you. All right, well, we have time for a few questions, I believe. You didn't actually connect the different effects in the two regions with the age cohorts directly. Is there an explanation for what's going on there? Is it just they lived, experienced, they experienced the context yeah. differently? Yeah, I think that's in that's formative years? yeah. That would be our argument that, that in fact, sort of growing up in southern Italy in the in the 1960s was different from growing up in in uh, and living that still living in southern Italy. That's important too. Um, uh, from uh, growing up and living in northern Italy, so that that would be the kind, that would be our logic anyway, um, and so we would sort of argue that that had to do with um, you know one of the things in the sixties were these attempts that various governments made to try and improve the standard of living in southern Italy. Well, all those policies have been abandoned over the last uh, 10, 15, 15 years, particularly. Um, and so many people in southern Italy, you know, find themselves in a sense left to their own uh, resources in, it, in, in, in a way. And I think that that's that's what's turned some people off in southern Italy they, then from voting. Whereas in northern Italy, people are turned off who came to political maturity or whatever you like during those years. Those, those are precisely now the, the more middle-aged people who are becoming supporters of Beppe Grillo. You know, so it's that it's a kind of very different. Uh, and if they're not voting, then they're, they're not voting because uh, they're uh, fed up with the corruption of the existing parties or because of, of, of the, um, uh, the, the cast of characters and so on, not because of this kind of attitude towards uh, redistribution or, or what have you. That, that's how we would sort of interpret it. So is the implication that, I'll just follow up, is the implication yeah. that younger generations are more likely to have a collective experience across the country, or do you think that the regional divide should continue well, to think, have differential Yeah, Well, you see there are differences between the national results and the, and the regional ones. So that suggests that there is some kind of systematic difference between being young in southern Italy from being young in northern Italy. I mean, unemployment rates in southern Italy are much, much higher than in the north. What you, the question that that begs, of course, is that, well, then, back in the 50s and 60s, people moved from southern Italy, and so why don't they move now? And, and that we don't, I don't have an answer to that question. Some of that may well be because there are certain kinds of programs and so on uh, for people to become unemployed and what have you uh, that encourage people, in a sense, to stay, to stay, to stay home, so to speak. Um, but there really is a systematic difference between northern and southern Italy. I mean, it's just no good. Well, I've been waiting all year to ask a geographic question. Our first geographer this year. Um, all the, the maps and the analyses look like they use consistent spatial units. 
And I was wondering what what, what are those units? Yeah, these are probably actually units. consistent over time. Yeah. Yeah, well, we had to add some new ones because new provinces were created. So, for example, uh, there was a new province of Prato, you know, which was carved out from the province of Florence. In, uh, but then we went, we went back and used that from the beginning. So, so, so we have a consistent set of about, it's, I think, 95, 95 units over time. So there are, there are base units for this analysis. And you can make arguments about whether that's a great thing. You know, maybe we, maybe we should have more local units. You know, there are thousands of comuni in Italy, you know, municipalities, and that would, at one level, you know, uh, let's say as an aspiration, it would be great to have that that sort of granular data. But this is about the best we can do, and this is the often the lowest level at which you can actually collect electoral data. You can get census data and so on for other uh, levels, but this is about this is about the best you can do. And to retain at least a degree of comparability over time. Yeah. No, we really worry about about stuff like that. Yeah. What's the uh, relationship between Five Star and other um, internet parties in Europe? Today do you feel like there's a network yeah, it's an interesting question because I really don't. I really don't know. I mean, I, that would be that would be the honest, <laughs> the honest answer. Um, um, you know, increasingly, even the other parties are trying to kind of go. I mean, remember the quote from Berlusconi. You know, you know. Now I have to I have to learn about the internet, um, um, and so, so in a way, they're all. But, but but in a sense, it's always them like icing on the cake. The cake is something else. For this movement, I mean, the internet really is the, the core of the whole thing. And even if it takes on a kind of uh, mysterious uh, aspect to it, because as I was pointing out, a lot of the people who vote for the Five Star Movement are not really being mobilized through the internet, uh, particularly in parts of Italy where there's a very low rate of, of penetration of of the of the internet. Nevertheless, um, I think other other political movements in other parts of Europe are really moving very much in this direction. I think you're probably thinking more about, like as we talked about before, the pirate parties and so on in Iceland or in or in Sweden or in uh, or in Germany. And I think many of those groups really are are built around the internet. And from what I know, there are, there are people like Casaleggio did have connections with. Uh, with these people, and it will be a really interesting topic to investigate because I don't think anyone really has, has looked at that. Um, and so, in many ways, I think the Five Star Movement is seen as kind of sui generis in, in many respects, partly because it's of its incredible sudden success. I mean, this is an incredible story, isn't it? It's like an overnight sensation between 2000 and from 2009 to 2013, becoming the part the the the, the, uh, the I'm gonna, I was going to say party. I mean, the language here is, is you know doesn't help. But becoming the dominant political phenomenon <laughs> within Italian national politics over a matter of, of, of five years. I mean, it's just incredible. Yeah. Um, I'm just curious. Uh, you know, 